if it's okay with you, I think I'm going to leave the lights off and try and save some heat. I heard this week that uh, the average person produces the same amount of heat as a 100 watt light bulb. So I thought, how can that be? Because some of us are dimmer than others. <laughs> But we're going to try and keep it a little bit cooler in here. Um, before I get into today's message, um, we have a number of praises that uh, I think we need to share. Um, we have two miracles with us right here today. Dave Hunter, who has been struggling with blood clots and... and uh, other health issues and, and God has just answered and answered and answered. Um, Ron Beckham, who last week uh, suffered a stroke, is here with us today. And as normal as you're ever going to get, right? <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> um, also, Christopher, my our, our oldest son, uh, went into diabetic ketoacidosis on Monday. When they admitted him into the hospital, he had a blood sugar of 788. And that's, you know, organs start to suffer damaging effects there. But thus far, everything is checked out okay. Uh, they found out that his pump was not actually administering the insulin when he thought it was. So um, we have much to be thankful for. So does anybody have a praise that they would like to share this morning? Yes. I'm here. You're here. But Gordy is not here. Huh? But Gordy is not here. No, he's on his way. I need we need prayer for him because he has to ride through the smoke and stuff. I'll put that on my list. But our house is sold and we are now home. Yes, welcome home. <laughs> for those of you that don't understand, Deb and Gordy, they've been members of our church for, oh gosh, three years, four years now, but they live in po lived in Pocatello. God has brought them home. So now they're looking for a house here, uh, and they will be permanent fixtures. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes? Uh, the test on uh, Betty Shorten were all very good and successful. We pray that. Amen. And she will be having her surgery on the 9th. And the fact that she can have the surgery is a definite praise. Mm -hmm. Yeah? You already mentioned Ron, but I want to praise God. Well, I was going to give a praise for you because um, some of you may not know, but Pat suffers from cluster headaches. And they'll come one after the other and migraine intensity. It's been, she told me this morning, it's been 14 days since her last cluster headache. So that's a huge. Thank you. Anyone else? I didn't mean to steal your thunder. Okay. Ken? We've had some issues uh, with our house, different things, and it seemed like our pleas for somebody to deal with stuff has kind of went unanswered. And I kind of reached the point to that. I was frustrated. And wondering how far I got to go with this thing called grace, my dead calls. <laughs> friends and you know Christian brothers and sisters well anyway you know I just I said or this ain't this ain't the way it's supposed to be logically and common sense wise and it just makes me pretty doubtful uptight upset I don't give a damn it's in your hands and, well you know this been going on for a couple months all of a sudden I just got to a point, I said, no more texting. No more talking to call me. I hate this text. I don't care, I'm sorry. But it's, there's no personal communication, you know? So I just reached a point, finally, he has been to call, and he's been busy, and apologized, and blah, blah, blah. And the next day, insurance suggestion from somebody else's insurance showed up, and he said, I'm not a problem, I don't care of it. But it's not that the aspect of the material things, it's just it's the frustration we can go through. Sometimes when you think you're ignored and you've been 
violated in the sense, where's justice? Then you realize it's not up to you to administer it, but the Lord's in control. And it's in His hands, and it's in His hands. That's a difficult thing. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Uh, you know, whenever we question ourselves how far to take this grace thing, I find a good answer is as far as we would want it extended to us. Excellent answer. Because I know a lot of times I, I get, I have a whole zoo of pet peeves. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they are well fed. <laughs> and and it, it's easy for me to get frustrated. And, and uh, you know, that's one of those things that I really am having to work through. Uh, I don't like noise. I don't like chaos. I like order and quiet. <laughs> I was not thinking. But we I thought had, it was the only word one. Uh, we had all, all but one of our grandchildren at our house yesterday. <laughs> Please pray for me. I love my grandchildren. I like them when they're asleep. <laughs> so um, I, I certainly understand, you know, it, it's easy to get frustrated and it's easy to get into our flesh, but we've got to remember that, you know, God has extended to us grace that supersedes our every sin. Amen. And how then can I hold a grievance against somebody else? Um, you know, but, but Scripture does call us to be as shrewd as serpents and as innocent as does. And that's actually part of the message for next week that we'll be talking about. Um, anyone else? Anybody else have a praise they would like to share? Robin. 15 year old uh, granddaughter, Sierra, uh, just had a successful shoulder surgery. After about a year, she tore her shoulder pretty bad about a year ago. And, and you know, of course, the doctor goes, oh, no, nothing wrong. You just got a sprain. You know, as soon as the first clear up, you know, you know, so they, they uh, she just had a surgery at Shriners Hospital in Sacramento. And, uh, her pain level is under control, and it looks like it's uh, it's going to heal, heal very well. So. Now, is this the one that was just recently saved? Um, when, when you guys were out there at Easter time? Mm -hmm. No, she was already saved. Okay. So, okay. Uh, this is my daughter's eldest, uh, Sierra. So. Okay. I have to make notes. If I don't make notes, it didn't happen. Anyone else? Lori. Uh, I just keep thinking it's been almost two years since my hand. I wasn't even supposed to maybe move my fingers, and I don't mm -hmm. think so. I'm just grateful. Amen. It to heal. Amen. Yes, and that, that piece of furniture is still in the house. <laughs> Every time I look at that, I think of you. Okay, I saw a hand over here somewhere. Jeannie. I want to praise God for the work he's doing at a bunch of our grandkids. Amen. We kind of feel like maybe we're raising up a little army. <laughs> awesome. Hallelujah. But there were some times that you weren't really sure those prayers were being heard, huh? God works in his timing when it's perfect. Monica. I was really, really, really sick, and I'm so much better. Amen. 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 Awesome. Awesome. Yes, he is. Anyone else? Here? My dad just got a couple of dogs. All right. Awesome. That helps out a lot, doesn't it? Good. All right. Um, open your Bibles. We're going to start off uh, in Proverbs. So go to Proverbs chapter 13. Um, we are talking, or have been talking about money. And there's a, a couple of points that I want to reiterate from previous weeks. First, whose is it? Uh, right. You are his what? Steward. 
steward is someone who takes care of the owner's stuff. We need to look at all of our things as being first his. And, and remember that we give an account. Um, we will stand before God and he's going to ask us, what would you do with what I gave you? Now, don't panic. I don't think God's going to boot you out because you bought a boat. I'm not worried about that. But I want to make sure that we understand that everything that we have, we have got to hold like this. Okay? Because when you hold on to it like this, two things happen. One, in order to give you something better, God has to force your hand open. I think it was Corey Ten Boom that said, I have learned to hold things with an open hand because I don't like it when God forces my hand open. Okay? And, and so when you hold it with an open hand, it's free. He can take it and put it wherever he wants. But he can also put whatever he wants you to have in that hand. Okay? You know, I've heard it said, you know, God only gives three answers. Yes, no, or not now. I don't agree with that. I think it's yes, or I've got something better for you. Because we, we don't see very clearly, do we? We tend to be excited about what's right in front of us. God sees around the corner. So, <clears throat> first principle that we need to understand is that it's God's money. Um, in, a, in three or four weeks, we are going to talk about tithes and offerings and, and alms. And one of the things that I, I will say right now has always cracked me up is, you know, people say, oh, I, I've got to give God his 10%. <laughs> really how generous of you since he gave you 100% <laughs> um, so today we're going to continue off of where we ended last week um, the, the first point the first message was we've got to understand it's God's money second point is God cares how you get it okay God is concerned about how you get what you have. Um, we talked last week, I, I talked about a couple of different methods of, of preaching. Uh, I, I shared with you that this, this sermon uh, series is, is topical preaching. Okay? Because there are an estimated 2,000 verses throughout the scripture that talk about money. And, and there's no way I can get to each one of those. Now, if we take out the ones that just mention money, as in, you know, the, the passage where it says that Judas was given 30 pieces of silver, okay, that's not instructional, it's just referencing money. If we take out those passages, we end up with 270, give or take, instructional passages, instructional verses about what God thinks about money. Now, 88 of those, so almost a third deal with how you get it. So do you think that might be an important topic, and an important issue for God? Yeah. Uh, God thinks it's important enough that he talks to us about it a great deal. Now, it's not important to him because he already owns everything and, and nothing's going to impress him anyway. But he wants us to understand it's important because it becomes a problem for us this is a, an area of weakness in our lives. Jesus even went so far as to say that you cannot love God and mammon, which, which the, the, the direct root of mammon is money, but the idea behind mammon is it's, it's your stuff. Okay? It's your possessions. It's, it's not just the cash you have, but it's all the things that you consider yours. Okay? I, I know a lot of people that don't have a lot of cash, but they have a lot of stuff. <laughs> And they get really tight when God starts to mess with their stuff. Okay? So, um, you know, you, God makes a point that, that you can't love Him and your stuff because you will either come to love one and hate the other or you will cherish the other and despise the one. So, there, there's a, a direct competition, a battling that goes on. Now, some of us deal with this to a greater level and others deal with it to a lesser level. 
okay? But we all deal with it in some way. Um, I really thought I was not a very material person. I didn't have a lot of concern about stuff. Uh, uh, you know, I take it, I don't care, until my grandchildren got my books. <laughs> and I would find a page from a book. <laughs> And there's cute little crayons. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know who did it, don't you? <laughs> or you go to pick up a book and the things fall out and they're not in the right order. And, and so I, I found that there are certain areas that I, I tend to be very possessive and, and don't touch my stuff. Okay. Um, <laughs> Wow, we got a whole peanut gallery. <laughs> so, Proverbs chapter 13. We need to understand that Proverbs are the observation of the wisest man that ever lived. Right? Okay? Solomon is writing down the things that generally occur. Now, we need to understand these are not specific promises. Okay? It's not always going to turn out the way the proverb reads because, because Solomon is not writing a book of promises. He's writing a book of wisdom. I have observed. These are the things I see. This is what usually happens. Okay? Now, he's observing the way God works. And so it's not necessarily wrong to equate that to the way that God works. But I, I caution you don't find a, a passage that speaks right to uh, something that you want and say, oh, God said I can have it. Okay? We, we, we all tend to do that. We all tend to want to take that one particular verse out and apply it because it benefits us the most, and we disregard the context in which it's used. Okay? And, and that gets us into a lot of trouble. All right? So, Proverbs, chapter 13, verse 11 says, wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. <clears throat> hastily. I talked about this briefly last week. The Hebrew word for hastily literally translated means a vapor. That's kind of a weird word, right? The idea behind it, though, is, is that it, it's something that you, you come by um, vainly. Okay? It's, it's this idea that, that it's um, not really done in integrity. Okay? Um, you, you kind of maybe cut corners. Um, that's not something you really want to do. Dennis has got a funny story about a corner, though. Dennis was sharing with us a while back when he used to do surveying, and he went out to <coughs> mark the line on a piece of property, and, and the, the guy that ran the wire cut the corner. And the wire didn't go down to the corner and across, it just went across. And Dennis is doing what surveyors do, magic and he's looking at what he needs to look at and he walked right into that wire Dennis did you utter godly utterances uh, it was before long ago I don't remember <laughs> I bet you there was God in it somewhere <laughs> cutting corners doesn't get you what you need okay so let's let's take a look at this um, wealth gathered hastily will dwindle Can anybody tell me, what does the Bible have to say about gambling? No. Don't? No. Okay, where does it say that? Well, that's a good shot. 
It's in, it's in either the Old Testament or the New Testament. Good <laughs> chance it's in Proverbs. <laughs> the, see, the, the idea is that there's an entire flow of thought through Scripture where gambling is not something that you're called on to do. As a matter of fact, the only time we see gambling that was encouraged, and it's not even really gambling, was the casting of the lots. Okay? And that was what God used to make His will clear. This was predating the Holy Spirit being sent down to indwell us. Not predating the Holy Spirit, because you can't. But the, this, this uh, casting of the lots, they would take the, the token from each person and usually there was an initial or, or a mark or something engraved in it and they put it in a pot and they'd shake the pot around until one came out and that was the one that God chose. Now, can anybody tell me where the last time we see this being used in the scripture is? Pax. Pax. Give me more. Yeah. They, they, the, 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 the 11 disciples got together and they said, you know, Peter spoke and said, you know, the number was supposed to be 12. We need to choose one from among us. And, and there were two that met all the qualifications. They put their whatever they were in and they shook them up and then one came out and, and we had a new disciple. Okay. Um, that's the last time we see it because immediately after that, what happens? Wham! The Holy Spirit indwells. Okay. And, and the Holy Spirit is the one that talks to us and, and leads us and, and fulfills the promise in the Old Testament that it will be the voice that tells us to go to the left or to the right. All right. So this, there's this whole flow of thought throughout Scripture that, that speaks against gambling for, for two reasons. One, it's not yours anyway. So you're, you're putting out there something that doesn't belong to you in the hopes that you will get more back. You're not trusting in your provider. You're not that trusting in Jehovah Jireh. You're, you're trusting in luck. The randomness. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to tell you how far to take that. I've heard people won't buy lottery tickets. I don't buy lottery tickets and evidently that means I won't win. Darn. Um, we're going to talk about that in, in just a couple of minutes too. But <clears throat> you, you can't give away what's not yours. And when you gamble, you're taking something of God's and you're putting it up at risk and taking it away from where God would desire it to go in the hopes that you will get more, which you will then do what with? Yeah. It doesn't end, does it? Um, there are some churches that frown on bingo. I never gambled on bingo. Um, my, my mom loves bingo. She actually got for one of her presents, she actually got one of the little bingo rolling things and she loves to, and she loves to pull them out and call the numbers and the, and the different kinds of bingo. And, and when the whole family gets together, mom, you know, mom's going to ask, and say, I'll bring my bingo stuff. <laughs> and, and hey, it's fun. You know, it's, it's something that even the little kids can do. So, you know, we sit down and you have your cards and, and some of them have more than others because they're really tense about winning. And, and so, um, you know, is bingo gambling? You know, that's something that you've got to take before God. Because if it's a problem for you, then yes, it's a problem. Okay? So, money gathered hastily. <clears throat> the front of your uh, bulletin, there's a passage. This is out of Luke chapter 12, verse 15. Um, Jesus is speaking to the disciples. And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Uh, does, can somebody give me a working definition for covetousness? Wanting something someone else has? Okay. Anybody else want to add to that? Being dissatisfied. 
Yeah, not being content with what you have, wanting more. Uh, you know, it's the, uh, the the competing with the Joneses. Um, I'm gonna. I'm actually gonna read a little bit more out of this passage here. Um, um, so in Luke chapter 12, I'm going to start in verse 13. Because so I, I want you to understand why Jesus is saying what he's saying. Okay, So Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 13. Um, someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. You gotta wonder some of the stuff that Jesus had to put up with. You know, here he is revealing the kingdom, the coming kingdom of God, revealing hope and salvation for all mankind. And this guy's worried about stuff. But he said to him, Jesus, speaking to this person, he says, "Man, you gotta wonder. It's gotta be like, man." <laughs> me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, this is to the crowd gathered around him, he says, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Okay? And then he immediately launches into a peril. He says, um, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. He had a good harvest. And he thought to himself, what shall I do, for I have nowhere to store my crops? And he said, aha! Well, he didn't say that. Um, had living here. I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And then I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax. Eat. Drink. Be merry. But God said, I love that phrase, but God. But God said to him, who? Now, we don't really understand the gravity of this word. Okay? Because we have a, a lot of words that, that tend to be a lot more uh, disparaging of a person's character. But Jesus warned that if you call a person a fool, that, that you're in danger of judgment. Okay? So when God is speaking to him and he calls him a fool, this is not a light accusation. This is a judgment. Okay? Now, does anybody remember what the, the term fool actually represented throughout most of the Old Testament? What's that? I'm sorry? Nimrod. Nimrod. Well, the, the, the phrase, what the actual Hebrew contains. Unbeliever. Unbeliever. It's, it's actually someone who is um, inclined to evil. They're without a moral compass. They, they don't, they, they, they're the kind of drifting along, but if they're given a choice, they'll probably go toward evil. Okay? So when, when God is speaking fool, he's not... You don't, you don't have this picture of a court jester. Okay? Pointy shoes with bells on them. You know, and a dancing around and frolicking. And, uh, I kind of wonder about those kings. Somebody came into my house and did that. It would be a very quick 911 call. And I sure as heck wouldn't pay the person. So God says, Fool! This night... Your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Okay. Now, I'm going to address the last part of this scripture next week. But what I want you to understand is... Jesus is looking and speaking about eternal things here. And this man comes to him. And what is this man thinking about? Himself. Himself. He's thinking about the instant gratification, isn't he? Give me. I want it. I want it now. 
Show me the money. <laughs> okay? And, and Jesus, you know, it's funny that he says this because I think when Jesus says, man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? Do you guys kind of get the feeling there's kind of a twist here? Because isn't Jesus going to be the judge? Yeah. And, and I think what he's trying to point out here is, man, you got your eyes in the wrong place. You know, I make a judgment here on earth and either you're, you're immediately gratified and you get your money, which is obviously the most important thing to you, and that is going to direct your attention away from God, or I rule not in your favor, and you go away bitter and angry, and your eyes still aren't turned toward God. So when, when Jesus is talking like this, it's almost like he's reduced his, his level of language to like junior high. <coughs> All right, you want to act like a child? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to treat you like a child. Okay, so how do we look at this? Wealth gathered hastily. Um, just just a, a simple Google search. Go out and, and look at um, the lottery winners. Bad news. And look and see where they are today. Uh, there was one case, a man won $455 million. My brain can't even, it boggles my brain. Okay? So even with what Uncle Sam took, the man's got money. Four and a half years later, he's broke. He has nothing. <coughs> we think, oh, if I could just have. And we want to lay up treasure for ourselves here on earth. Just like that farmer, I want a bigger, whatever it is you want a bigger of, house, car, TV, whatever. If I could just have that, I would be happy. But they're not. They get it. And, and because there's no discipline that came along with the getting of it, it comes and it goes. Okay? So, another thing. Um, Mike Tyson. You guys remember Mike? <coughs> the ear biter? Yeah. <laughs> the boxer? You know why he had to become a boxer, right? Because of that crazy voice of his. I mean, you're growing up in the hood and you walk around talking like this. And you got that high squeaky boy? You gotta learn to fight. <laughs> but Mike Tyson earned over four hundred million dollars himself with his fighting, with his skills, and yet he ended up going bankrupt. Look at all these these athletes, these these modern day athletes that are paid millions of dollars to chase a ball. to potentially catch said ball, throw said ball, hit said ball, kick said ball, and they're paid millions of dollars. Now, I don't begrudge these men. Um, there is a, a gentleman that wrote a book about the, 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 the whole kind of idea of this instant wealth versus slow wealth. And, and uh, one of the things that he said, he, he calls it the principle of 10,000 hours. Has anybody ever heard about the principle of 10,000 hours? See, we look at people like um, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates. Uh, we look at like Michael Jordan or, or, or Tiger Woods. And, and we look at them and we see their success. And we go, wow, look at how much money this person has. Look at all the stuff they have. They've got... Houses for their cars. But what we don't see is what it took for them to get to that point. The 10,000 hours that it took to 
build a business. The hours, the, the 60, 80, 100 hour weeks that it took them to get that business going and to make it thrive or to hit a golf ball repeatedly to get the form down. Now, evidently, there's quite a trick to this because I've seen some of the, 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 the training things and kudos to you, Scott and Dennis, because if I had to think that hard about hitting a ball, that's why I don't play golf. That and they get mad when you drive the car all crazy. But there is a technique that needs to be developed and it requires hours and hours and hours of discipline. Okay? So the, the 10,000 hour principle. Okay? We don't look at those. We just look at the success. Okay? We're, we're the, the, the Olympics. We're going to see some of the greatest athletes in the world competing. And they'll have their spotlight for however long. Now think about this for a minute. You want to be known as the world's fastest racer. You want the world to know you. Usain Bolt, fastest runner out there. The faster you run, the less airtime you get. <laughs> now, I'm going to be the last place, dude. Come on! I'm on the air. Okay? The faster you go, the less airtime you get. Well, then obviously there's the, the accolades that go with that. You know, and then there's you know the, the camera that follows you around and watches you smoking weed and everybody goes, Oh, what kind of person are you? Well, he's the world's greatest swimmer. So there's the 10,000 hour principle. So built slowly by slowly by slowly by slowly until they develop that technique, until they develop that business, until they develop that process. This is what we're looking at in this, this passage in Proverbs. This is all about your work ethic. Okay? This is about how you go about getting and building. Okay? Um, <clears throat> a couple points that I want to share with you. <coughs> These are questions that I'm going to pose to you that, that I want you to ask yourself about the things that you have, how you got the things you have. All right? Question number one. <clears throat> James McDonald uses this phrase. He says, are you tempted to shape the sail? Do you alter the truth to make the sail go? For example, how many of you have tiny kitchens? Come on, don't be ashamed. I mean, you cook in that kitchen. Yes, Christy is waving her hand. It's not that we have a tiny kitchen, we have too much junk. And, and when she's cooking, there tends to be three or four other people in the kitchen with her. But, but if you were going to sell your house, I guarantee you, your realtor would not say, Tiny kitchen. What would they call it? Cozy. Step Charming. Step saver. Cozy. They, they would dress it up. You know, that was the one that I hated that when we were looking for a place to live and you'd see step saver. Step saver? That means you can't turn around in your kitchen. You're like, fridge. Stove and back out dinner, okay? So, so that, but, but is this something that you do in order to get the sale? Do you alter the truth? Do you kind of dress it up? Or do you let it be what it is? Yeah, it's got a small kitchen. I don't like to walk. I don't like to cook. Okay? Question number two. Do you pad your expenses? Do you alter the numbers or are you honest? Are you saying exactly what was spent? 
Are you looking to get more out of it than you actually put into it? <coughs> Number three, this is a huge one. Do you take payment in cash? So you don't have to declare the income and pay taxes. Jesus addresses this, Mark 12, 17. The Pharisees, the teachers of the law, they're seeking for a way to trap Jesus. Jesus is in the temple. And they come to him. Now, you, you got to keep in mind that the temple, they were probably in, in what was known as Solomon's Colonnade on the, on the south end of the temple. Well, on the north west corner overlooking the temple is the Praetorian Tower, the, the, the fortress. And, and the Romans would overlook the temple to make sure nothing was going on that was going to cause them problems. So Jesus is in the temple, which is the center of all Judaism. And they're being watched by the world power. <clears throat> and the Pharisees come to him and they say, Master, teacher, tell us, should we pay taxes to Caesar? Well, you've you got to think about this for a minute. If he says, yes, pay taxes to Caesar, you think all those Jews around him are going to be happy? Because they're, they're paying taxes, they're getting ripped off. Because the way the Romans did it, they would take a person and they would make him a tax collector and they would say, this is what the tax is due, whatever you get above that is yours. Okay? So, so you know, we know of at least two tax collectors that had an encounter with Jesus and, and had to address that issue. You guys know who they are? Matthew and Zacchaeus. Matthew and Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. Okay? And and so here, here they come and there Jesus is, okay, well if I say yes, the Jews are going to be mad. Because they don't like the Romans. They don't like the idea that they have to pay taxes to this foreign power. But if I say no, the Praetorian, the Romans, are looking at us and and there's a good chance that when I walk out of this temple, they're going to pick me up in the street. <laughs> you don't think you should pay taxes. Well, let's, let's look at your... You want to talk about the IRS? Putting the thumb screws to you? No, this was like literally what they would do. Okay? And so the, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, they think they got him trapped, don't they? Because this is, this is a critical issue now. Because either he's in trouble with the Romans and he's their problem, or the Jews are going to hate him. But either way, it's a load off of our hands. But Jesus was smarter than that, wasn't he? What did he do? He said, show me the coin with which you pay the tax. So they gave him a denarii. And he looked at it and he held it up and he said, whose picture is on this? And whose inscription? Who's, whose coin is this? He said, well, well, Caesar. And he takes it and he gives the coin back to him. And he says, well, give to Caesar what is Caesar. But give to God what is God's. What do you do with an answer like that? What, who, what idiot thought of that question? You made us look stupid again. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta wonder about these Pharisees. You gotta wonder about these guys. Nothing worked with them. Every time they come out looking pretty bad, don't they? But see, Jesus is making it very clear that while we may disagree with the taxes, while we may not like the taxes. Why we may even think the taxes are, are wrong, Jesus is making clear you pay them. Okay? Pay the taxes. Look, God is the one that has given you everything you have. You don't think He's going to be able to take care of you when you have to give a portion of it to the government that He has instituted? <coughs> he will take care of you. He's promised He will take care of you. Okay? Next question Do you inflate your deductions at tax time? Do you claim more than you really should? <clears throat> Jeremiah 22, 17 says, But you have eyes and heart only for your dishonest gain. Is, is getting that extra 
percentage back or, or not given, is that more important to you than the integrity that God is calling you to? One point I want to make, we we'll wrap up here. Does anybody uh, know anything about the Protestant work ethic? This is going back to like the, the 1600s. You see, the Protestants had this idea that work, hard work, labor was good. That it was good for you. Is good for you to do. You see, work itself is not part of sin, right? Toil is, but work is not, because God put Adam and Eve in the garden not to just vacation and sit my ties. He put them in there to work, to take care of his stuff, to husband what God had created. So, we were created to work. How many of you have, have heard this idea that you gotta, you're got you supposed to love your job? I would love to know where that came from. Look, because work is something that God created us to do, so we're supposed to be about it. We're supposed to be keeping our hands busy. But the toil is part of sin. That's the, that's the repercussions for the fall of man. You know, when, when man was cursed, God didn't say, you know, it's going to be work for you to grow your, your, your plants. He said, you're, you're going to have to contend with weeds. It's going to be hard work. Work was already there. Adam was already working. But now it's going to be hard. Okay? The Protestant work ethic is that this is actually a good thing for you that you should take pleasure in. Why? Why should we take pleasure in hard work or working hard? Because we do it unto God. Because we do it unto God. And this, this idea that, oh, you've got to love your job. Now, there, if you love your job, fantastic. Absolutely great. But you know how many people I know jump from job to job to job to job looking for the job that they love? When really the idea is they don't want to work. There's not going to be a job out there that you're going to get that you're going to love because you don't like to work. See, work is something we have to do, one, because we were created, and two, because this is a fallen world. So work hard at what God has given you to do because you're not doing it for your boss. You're not doing it for the company. You're not even doing it for yourself or your family. You're doing it for God. You are repping the brand. You are representing God in your workplace. Whatever that is. Don't give a bad rep because of your slovenly, sloppy work. Do it hard. Do it worthily. Look at Joseph. Look at Daniel. These are men that were put in bad places. And yet because of the ethic of work that they had, they gained favor and were elevated to positions of authority. Okay? Parents, when you're praying for your children, pray that they would be Joseph's in the workplace. That that company would profit because your child is working there. Work ethic. One thing I will share, and we're going to close. Paul writes at the end of 2 Thessalonians, that if anyone is not willing to work, they shouldn't eat. That's, that's pretty heavy. Now, don't get me wrong. Some people can't work. I'm not addressing that. Okay? Within your ability to work, work. Hey. 
Don't live off of entitlement. Set your hand to do what you can do. And do it as unto God. Do it as a, a, a love offering unto God. <clears throat> One thing James McDonald said that I actually wrote down word for word because I, it really spoke to me. You cannot work too hard but you can work too much. You know, I, I know people that, that work to the detriment of their family life, to the detriment of their walk with God, to the, the, the breaking of commitments to other things. Work hard at what you do. Do it with your utmost strength. You do it unto God. <coughs> that he would be honored. Don't let look, pe people look down on the body of Christ because of how you work. Let them want to hire other Christians because they're good workers. Amen? Amen. God cares very much how you get what you get. Father, we bless you today. And I ask, Lord God, that you would settle in our hearts your word, your thinking, your heart. Father, help us to be a people that in our workplace we bring you honor. <coughs> help us, Father, to be a good example of what Christians should be. Help us, Father, to to use discretion and discernment and wisdom with those things that you have gifted us with. Help us, Father, always to be pressing in heart after you. We bless you this morning, Father. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.